Welcome today to our Sunday update here at Faith Dialogue and Prophecy Countdown. My name is Ken Bear. I'm the pastor of Faith Dialogue. We provide two updates every single week, one on Sunday and one on Wednesday, um, to be able to enable you to understand the scriptures related to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now on Sundays, we're presently going through the Gospel of Matthew. We go through chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Today, my message is Jesus, Lord of the Sabbath. Now, our Sunday message premieres uh, at 1 o'clock, 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Standard Time. On Wednesdays, our updates are always prophecy related. And typically, we take questions from you, the viewing and listening audience. Uh, our, our email address is prophecycountdownpodcast at gmail.com. It's a mouthful, so let me say it again. prophecycountdownpodcast at gmail.com. And I, I, I reply to every single one of our emails personally. I'll give you an answer as best as I possibly can based on what scripture has to say to any question you have. And that's where we get the actual questions for our prophecy updates. Uh, presently, we're going through the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But again, today is our, our Sunday update. And sun, in this, on Sundays right now, we are in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, my topic today is Jesus, Lord of the Sabbath, and it's from chapter 12 of the Gospel of Matthew. And it's a little long. Uh, we typically don't like to do five, six, seven verses, but uh, I wanted to group these together because they're all related. It's 14 verses. So just, uh, just uh, you can read along with me if you'd like to or, or listen to me, but I'm going to read all 14 verses beginning in verse 1 of chapter 12. 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread which was not lawful for him to eat, nor, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Verse 6, Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. And if you had known what this means, I deserve mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now when he had departed from there, he went into the synagogue, and behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, that they may accuse him? And he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? How much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Now today, as I mentioned, we have a relatively longer scripture reference, beginning in verse 1, going all the way through verse 14. So I want to jump into the, to the main lesson. I want the main thing to be the main thing. And the main thing here is actually in verse 8. Verse 8, where Jesus concludes his rebuke of the Pharisees for their false accusation against his disciples with a simple declaration. And Jesus says, For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, this one verse, For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath, actually has two titles that Jesus used in, re in reference to himself. Son of Man. This is a phrase seen throughout the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus used regarding himself. This is a powerful phrase that the prophet Daniel used in describing the Messiah. He said he called him the Son of Man. Remember that most of the Messiah references in the Old Testament refer to the Messiah as a deliverer, someone like King David that would rule and reign until all the tribes of Israel and lift Israel above all their neighboring nations. Daniel, however, in this one reference referring to the Messiah as the Son of Man, lifted the Messiah up to deity rank. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, the prophet Daniel saw one like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven and approaching the Ancient of Days. This Ancient of Days is God. 
Uh, God the Father, we know, the immortal, invisible, and only true, wise God, Jehovah God. For Jesus to embrace the term Son of Man, he acknowledges his role as the one who not only knows God, but is known by God and is able to ascend into the clouds of heaven um, as well. Now let's look at this a little further. Uh, Jesus introduces the second title in the verse 8 as well. He calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. Now this phrase, Lord of the Sabbath, is not only found in this, gospel, this passage, uh, chapter 8 in the Gospel of Matthew, but it's also found in the Gospels of Mark and Luke. Jesus referring to himself as the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus says, for the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Now, in these verses, Jesus is proclaiming that he alone is the one who exercises authority, even over the rules and the regulations that govern the Sabbath day. As such, Jesus was proclaiming to the world, especially to the disbelieving Pharisees, that he's Lord and the Lord over the law, the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, because as he is God in the flesh, he's the creator and the author of these very laws. Now, the Pharisees had instituted a very complex and confusing system of Sabbath laws on their own. These were man-made laws. These weren't given to them by God, but the Pharisees expanded the law. In fact, there were 39 categories of forbidden activities uh, of things that you could do or not do on the Sabbath. And these religious leaders had made themselves in essence, lords of the Sabbath. And I think this is what Jesus is referring to where he calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath because the Pharisees felt that they were the lords of the Sabbath and they were also lords over all of the people. You know, even as Jesus called himself Lord of the, self, Lord of the Sabbath, he himself came to serve. You know, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, Jesus said, you know that those who regard themselves as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Uh, not so with you. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, this is who Jesus refers to himself, both as the Son of Man, but also of the, as the Lord of the Sabbath. And while Jesus had the authority to overrule the Pharisees' traditions and regulations because he had created the Sabbath, and the Creator is always greater than the law itself, Jesus came to serve. And in all aspects, he obeyed the law perfectly. Perfectly. Jesus, Jesus was tempted as we are, but was completely without sin. The Pharisees could claim that he ignored their man-made laws and regulations. However, Jesus claimed the authority to correctly interpret the meaning of the Sabbath and all the laws pertaining to it because Jesus was Lord of the Sabbath. He's the one who knows where the exceptions are to be made for and necessary in order to accomplish the will of his Father. Now, here's another little-known fact about the Sabbath uh, that's important for all of us that follow Jesus because most of us that follow Jesus uh, go to church and we honor what's called the, the Lord's Day. Sunday is the Lord's Day. It's called the Lord's Day because it's the, it's the first day of the week and it's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. However, uh, it's not the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the seventh day. Don't confuse the Sunday, which is the Lord's Day, with the seventh day, the Sabbath. However, as the Lord of the Sabbath, meaning Jesus has come, and with his death and his resurrection, he became fulfillment of our Sabbath rest. Now, this rest, this, this, this rest we have because of the salvation we have in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ fulfilled the old law, and the, the Sabbath is no longer needed nor binding on believers. When Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, that's out of Mark chapter 2, verse 27, Jesus was attesting to this fact. And the fact is, is just as the Sabbath day was originally designed to give rest, it's not a church day, the Sabbath was designed as a day of rest. Just as God rested from his activity on the seventh day, God told us to 
rest, to cease laboring, um, and to, to attain uh, God's favor and rest. Now, we don't have to try to gain God's favor. We are given God's favor through His grace. We are saved by grace through faith. It's not by works. We don't have to earn that right. Now, the book of Hebrews make a very, makes a very interesting claim. It says this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest, talking about the Sabbath, still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Well, chapters 3 and chapter 4 in the book of Hebrews, the author makes a very interesting claim. He compares the rest that is found on the Sabbath to the rest that's found in salvation of being one with God through Jesus Christ. In chapters three and four, the writer of Hebrews speaks about the Sabbath rest. And remember, this was the purpose of the Sabbath, was rest. God rested on the seventh day. The author of Hebrews says, the promise of the Sabbath rest still stands for all as the promise of salvation through God's provision, which is Jesus Christ. He alone can provide the eternal rest of salvation through his blood shed on the cross for the remission of our sins. God's rest then is in the spiritual sense, the rest of salvation. Faith, the author goes on to assert, is the key. Faith is the key to entering this rest. The people of Israel had the gospel preached to them, but the gospel was no effect, no value to them, is what the book says in Hebrews, because those that heard it did not combine it with faith. That's Hebrews chapter four, verse two. Some had heard the good news of Christ, but they rejected it for a lack of faith. Now, this rest, the rest of Jesus in salvation, is available to all of us. Or as the Bible would say, whosoever, whosoever believes, as the Bible declares. The author of Hebrews makes this statement, which pertains to all of us. And he's actually quoting a psalm. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 and 8 says, So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness. My friends, Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Son of God, the Son of Man, and the Lord of the Sabbath. He's offering today the free gift of salvation and the needs in order to be, but it, well, I'm sorry, the, this, this gift of salvation, but it needs to be received. That's what the book of the Gospel of John says, that you need to receive this gift. This is what it says in, in the Gospel of John. It says, he, that's Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, even to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but his own did not receive him. But then here's the good news. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Amen and amen, my friends. Today is the day. Don't let the day pass without examining whether or not you belong to Christ. If you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life, I, I, I urge you to do so today. It's just a matter of acknowledging who he is, that he died on the cross for your sins, repenting of your sins, making an about turn, and deciding to follow Jesus, to understand that God rose him from the dead. And the Bible says you will be saved. Now remember, Jesus is coming back again soon. This is why it's so important for you to make sure that, that you have this salvation, that you have this rest, that you've attained this rest uh, because you are resting in the secure sign that Jesus is your Lord. The signs are upon us. I mentioned Israel before. Israel you know, came back into the land in 1948 after 1900 years. What a, what a super sign to remind us that the end is near. God bless you. Share this, like this, uh, this, this podcast, share with your friends, and we'll see you next week. Let me pray. Father God, we want to thank you, Lord. Thank Nearly every day, it's common to see, read, or hear something about the end of the world, the apocalypse, or end times. 
Author and pastor Kenneth Baer's The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom zooms in and breaks down biblical prophecy as it relates to Jesus' imminent return and the coming seven-year period, including The Great Tribulation. Available in both paperback and Kindle versions. Get your copy on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble and select Christian bookstores. The title again is The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom. You can also find it listed by author Kenneth Baer. Get your copy today. Thank you for joining us on Prophecy Countdown with Pastor Ken Baer. Don't leave without first sharing the latest episode with your friends. Be sure to join us again for the latest updates on Prophecy Countdown.